Welcome to this special show of Celebrate Life. I'm Gary DeCarlis, and I'm your host for today. Normally, we would have a speaker here, um, but uh, and this month was actually supposed to be Ken Liebertoff, but life circumstances are such that Ken will not be able to make it. So what we've done in place of having Ken actually in the audience here is to create this wonderful panel of friends of Ken's who collectively will talk about their dear friend, Ken Liebertoff, from different aspects of his life. Um, ironically, Ken just finished a book called Snapshots of a Life uh, that was published in January. And um, so we have a lot of great stories to share with our audience today, and uh, N+. Plus. So let me introduce the, uh, the uh, panel to you. So we have Steve Dale on my far left, we have um, Chris Lovell, we have Governor Howard Dean, we have Don Osmond, we have uh, Jimmy Fordham, and we have Lee Larson. Thank you all for coming today. So one of the things that we usually start a show with, actually before the show actually goes live, is to have the guests talk about um, five words that describe them. So instead of having Ken give us those five words, I thought I would throw that out to the audience, to you guys and have you think of words that describe Ken Liebertoff. Anyone wants to jump in, feel free. Funny. Funny. Absolutely. Do you want all five of them now? Or, uh... No, you, that's good. <laughs> you can go. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I think of him as funny, kind, intelligent, supportive, and athletic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I know Ken a little different. He was my boss, so I would think he was a great boss. He's been a father figure to me. He's been a mentor to me, and he's been a wonderful friend to me. And mm -hmm. I'm thankful for that. That's great. Yeah. Uh, I guess I would go with um, funny as well. I, I love sharing stories with Ken and laughing with Ken. Uh, <laughs> kind, certainly generous, uh, not just with his his time um, and and. Um, working in the state to really help people, but also just uh, in that he's just a wonderful friend. Um, yeah, yeah, Ken's a great guy. That was so, great, thank yeah. you. Now, I got to know him when I was in my first term in the legislature when we were trying to get a mental health parity bill, which uh, I, I'm informed today that was the first of its kind in the country. Yes. Um, and uh, I, so I wrote down smart, dedicated, principled, honest, honest, and relentless. <laughs> yes, 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 he is. Yes. <laughs> Chris? Yeah, perspicacious. He saw things as they <laughs> really are, mm. and uh, he saw through a whole lot of uh, flim flam. And uh, he, he was he was very smart, loyal. What a great friend. Yeah. What a what a dear and loyal friend. Uh, yeah. Funny, hilarious, <laughs> beyond <laughs> funny, uh, an extrovert, the yeah. most sociable human being. And he was a relentless foot falter on the tennis court. And we'll talk about that later on. I've got some Kenny stories. Okay. Steve. Uh, I, I agree with all the uh, adjectives that have been used, but uh, I would add a couple. Um, fearless. Um, he would say anything to anybody, and he could get away with it in ways that most of us couldn't. That's so uh, very true. Uh, influential. Um, hmm. People deferred to him even when you probably shouldn't. Um, so yeah. I'll talk more about that a little later. <laughs> and in some ways, he's larger than life. Um, yeah. He uh, he was a, a big personality <laughs> and a very effective personality. Yes, great, wonderful story, wonderful words to describe him. So we know from reading Ken's book and, and knowing Ken that he lost his dad at a very young age. Um, and, um, and, uh, and because of that, I think spent some time with his grandparents as much as um, with his mom and his sister. But I thought I'd send it over to Steve to tell a story early, of, a story early in Ken's life that I think is so illustrative of, of Ken Liebertoff. Take it away, Steve. I had the uh, privilege of being one of the first people to buy a uh, kid's book through uh, Bear Pond Books in Montpelier. Um, and uh, so I just greatly enjoyed reading. And some of the stories I didn't know much about, this one included, but um, 
I was just going to share this little story that, that when Ken was young, um, he and his grandmother used to go to Ebbets Field to <laughs> watch the Brooklyn Dodgers. They lived in Brooklyn, as you might guess. And um, they were both passionate about the Dodgers. And he has these childhood memories of the Phillies coming to town and beating the Dodgers. Um, and Robin Roberts was the pitcher who was most deadly uh, at that time, uh, mm -hmm. mid fifties. Mm -hmm. um, so decades went by and Ken found himself in Vermont. <laughs> and uh, in the early 2000s, um, the Mountaineers were created as a baseball team in Montpelier. And he read in the media that, um, oh, there was going to be a, a special celebration uh, that this uh, individual who was in the Hall of Fame was coming to Montpelier to throw out the first ball for the Mountaineers, and that individual happened to be Robin Roberts. By the way, I didn't mention that Ken describes that he had this um, deep hatred for Robin <laughs> Roberts because he was uh, so deadly on the, the Dodgers. Right. <laughs> so he made a point of going to the stadium in uh, the recreation field in Montpelier where they play ball. The reason that Robert Roberts came there is because most people, I think, in Vermont now know that Robin Roberts played ball there for a couple of summers mm -hmm. uh, prior to his major league experience. And so he had deep roots in the in the Green Mountains. So Ken decided he would go to this um, event, uh, to this ball game, and um, try to have an encounter with Robin Roberts. And uh, I'm going to read this little passage because um, Ken's voice is so... <laughs> His, his approach to the world is so clear. So he, he and I, I'm going to just read this little section. My friend minding the gate onto the field saw that I was serious and opened the entrance to the playing area. The Mountaineers dugout was just steps away. I ducked down and entered. Robin Roberts looked up at me. Robin Roberts was sitting in the Mountaineers dugout. And I was immediately taken by his grandfatherly appearance as he politely stood and shook my hand. After all, he was a Midwesterner from Illinois. His <laughs> eyes seemed to twinkle, and besides, he retained a handsome profile and a sweet-looking face. Classic Ken uh, buttering everybody up. <laughs> he was much shorter than I remembered as I thought back to 1955, and his body no longer radiated vigor or swagger. So now he's, now this is a quote from Ken. I have hated you for 60 years, Mr. Roberts, <laughs> and it is time to make amends and share good times past, I said with emotion as I introduced myself. If he were thinking, he, who is this strange guy next to me in the dugout, and what is he talking about? I would not have been surprised. Right. But he smiled, perhaps out of embarrassment or confusion, and we sat side by side as the Mountaineers game unfolded. Within a minute, I found myself in animated conversation and words poured out, gushing like a bubbling stream after a sudden downpour. And then he told him about his grandmother, Liebertoff, and so on and so forth. And they ended up talking for a lengthy oh. period of time. But I'm just picturing Ken sitting down and saying, I have hated you all these years. Um, yeah. one, one of many fabulous amazing. stories yeah. in this book. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Great stories. So. Uh, any other stories you anyone want to share? Want to jump in? Yeah, yeah go on, Chris. Uh, Ken, as you all know, was a superb athlete. He played for the University of Connecticut basketball team in the mid '60s, and those were the glory years. Uh, I think they were conference champions, and he had all the moves, which he carried with him onto the tennis court. And I first got to know Ken in the mid 70s at the old Wedgwood Courts in Montpelier. Um, and he was a, a solid player. Uh, we were all solid players, but that was it, just solid. Um, Ken, <coughs> Ken had some special moves on the tennis court, which he brought from basketball. And one was a lob. It was a disguised lob, and the ball would come at him. He was receiving serve, and the ball would come at him, and it looked like he was going to volley it, but he moved like he was doing a basketball shot like that, huh. and the lob would go into the backhand corner and right over my head over and over again. And The only other person did who did that was a... 
another Harvard psychologist by the name of Arthur W. Chickering. I don't know if any of you know Art Chickering. Mm. Is, or you would remember him. Right. It was required reading at UVM. That's right. So, so right. that's one tennis story, and I'll save the foot fault one for later. Okay, great. That must have been, he, he was a big, he's like 6'5". Yeah, he was tall. Six, yeah. yeah. So playing tennis, that's that's a lot of body to carry around. Yeah. There. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he was talented. Well, Governor, you have any stories? I got a show? few stories. I just want do want to tell the crowd if there's anybody under the age of 50 who's never heard of Robin Roberts. He was one of the truly great pitchers in the National League. Yeah. Probably, I, I wouldn't be shocked if he hadn't won the uh, MVP or the Cy Young Award. Yeah. And had a number of no hitters. He was formidable. He was formidable. Um, You're right. So I didn't know. Hall of Fame. I didn't know uh, Ken had uh, grown up in Brooklyn, which left me lots and lots of great stories. Uh, I didn't know Ken until I was a freshman legislator. And I cared deeply about health care, of course, since I'm a physician. And Ken, of course, cared deeply about mental health care. And so at that time, insurance companies, um, a lot of them didn't cover mental health. They just didn't cover it. And so we set out in my freshman, Ralph Wright did not think I was a good freshman legislator. Uh, he disapproved of my activism. So we set out to force insurance companies uh, to cover mental health for the, I think, that, I think, so you tell me, somebody told me it was the first bill of its kind in the country. Exactly. And I got together with a, uh, a wonderful guy who's my age, Jack Candon, who's, uh, who just passed away recently. And he was a lawyer and a terrific smart guy and we were both freshman legislators under the speaker Ralph Wright mm. um, and we both and Jack was a quick wit quicker, quicker than I so we used to go into the committees the health care committee and the finance committee and he would always start by well we're a lawyer and a doctor and we're here to tell you about mental health care <laughs> and the irony of the whole thing was a really heavy slog the insurance company lobbyists fought it like crazy and I left the uh, legislature and went in to become lieutenant governor. And Ken worked on this thing and worked on it and would never quit. And 14 years afterwards, I signed the bill. I was governor. That's how long it took to, to get the bill wow. through. Yeah. But it was a major, major bill. And I, I admire him so much. He, he was all the things I said. He was a lot of fun. He was smart. He was a great athlete. I fortunately never had the experience of playing against him. <laughs> I am not a great athlete. But the thing I admired him the most is he was fun, he was gentle, and he never took his eye off the ball. Mm. Never, never. It was always one inch at a time or one foot at a time, but he was going to get right. there, and it took him 14 years. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it was a good story. He was relentless, wasn't he? Yeah. Yep. He is, yeah. In a pleasant way. In a pleasant way. That's right. right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I can speak to my experience. Uh, so I met Ken uh, for the first time in uh, 1997. I would have been uh, 16, just about going into my 17th birthday, but a month away uh, at Camp Daybreak. Mm. Um, I was, uh, I had a friend uh, in high school at Twinfield where I went to high school and uh, she had just volunteered at the camp the, the summer before mm -hmm. and uh, knew that I was working with kids at Twinfield um, with Down syndrome specifically mm. and uh, thought it would be a good fit for me. And I was like, oh, sure, that sounds great. I had no idea really what I was signing up for um, and fell in love with the place. Mm. Um, you know, the kids experiencing a range of uh, mental health conditions and um, life struggles. Uh, it really spoke to me and it was a place where I felt at home. Um, and Ken, through the Vermont Association for Mental Health, I would find out later at the end of the summer, was responsible for Camp Daybreak. Mm -hmm. um, Ken would always come to camp. I spoke to the gratitude before um, and generosity before. He would always come to camp. And at the end of the season, uh, you know, a, a group of 50 to 60, 15 year olds exhausted from an intense week and he would be funny and uplifting and oh, wow. tell wonderful stories nice. and um <clears throat> i was fortunate then to to be at camp for many many years 27 years um right. and uh, yeah ended up working for ken as the director of camp daybreak many years later mm. um and ken always i always when i saw him on the phone or in person his his just warmth would come out in those conversations. It would always start with, Dan, you know, and that was always his way of, of greeting me. And uh, it was, uh, it became a joke sort of later on, but uh, it was always just very kind and, and lovely. Mm. And so, um, you know, uh, Ken really 
became an influential figure in my life, um, you know, and sort of paved the way personally and professionally for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I was with Camp Daybreak until 2018, uh, and now I work at Camp Tecumta, uh, doing similar work with a different population. Um, I met my wife at Camp Daybreak. We started no a family kidding. together. Wow. Um, so I, I owe a lot to Ken, mm. <laughs> quite a bit. That's so, wonderful. Yeah, and I've always, always thought of him as a good friend. That's great. Yeah. Nice story. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. I'm not a very good storyteller, but I'll just share. This is more of an emotional friendship story. Mm-hmm. I had just been hired as the uh, office manager for VMH. And so I've been there for a couple of weeks. And what had happened was the previous office manager used to do all the pro- taxes. And mm. I had... And what happened, we got a notice in the mail that the court of taxes weren't paid. And in the midst of all that, I was going, I had just lost my dog for nine years. He just passed away. And then my sister was dealing with uh, having her left lung removed, lung cancer. And Ken brought this up to me and I just lost it. We sat, we sat in the office. I just like kind of bawled my eyes out. And he was like, Jimmy, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. He was just, you know, it made all the difference. And mm-hmm. I could have been fired from that. And he was just so wonderful. And from that moment on, we just became, he was like a father figure to me and, and a mentor. And I was just so proud to work for him. And all the legislative work he was doing, that I felt in my part as an as a office manager in the background that, you know, I was helping him make things happen right. in my small way. Right. But is anything that I could do for him and for the organization. And mm. I met his mom through there, Lillian. Yep. She, she was a character. You, you can figure that out. She's a character. Yeah. You read yeah. this. Oh, I met her the first time. Yeah. He had to run to the legislature. So she, those, you remember the stairs that used to oh, have to yeah. climb up there? She would climb those. And then he, that, he came to me and said, Jimmy, my mother's here. You have to watch over her. Can you go get her something to eat? So I went to get her. And that's how I all became part of his family. It became all the Jewish religious holidays and a regular Thanksgiving. And he just made me a part of his family. That's and nice. I met his, you know, his granddaughter, Fiorella and Rodrigo and Jamie. And mm. so, I mean, it's more in, in, as business wise. I, I was just proud to be my small part of what he represented. And he obviously, might, I remember seeing him on the streets in Montpelier and the wild hair like Bernie Sanders. <laughs> and I always saw the tall guy and I was like, I always wonder, like, who the hell is that? <laughs> I was like, where did he come from? And then I worked for him. And it was just like, oh my gosh, what a small world in Montpelier, you know? It was, he, and he was a character he, and he was honest. And, and the annual meetings were killer. I mean, he was a great comedian. He had all the politicians there. I mean, oh. yeah, he didn't mince any words with them. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah he, had, he had a great way of bringing people, the, the, all the politicians together and pushing them on where they stood on mental health. Plus, yeah. and in front of. And speakers <laughs> and all the people who worked in mental health, which yeah. was huge. I right. mean, we've had 300 people and we have these different classes and, and you know, for mm. continuing education and everything. It was a wonderful event. Governor, you probably were on that podium many a time. With- I, oh, I was on the board for a while yeah. when I was in the legislature. I think I was in, I, I think I got off after I became lieutenant governor. But yeah, I remember those meetings. He is, uh, you know, it's just in, a, in addition to being all the great things, he's also an impresario. Yeah. And for you put him in front of a crowd and he is in his own element. <laughs> the lights go on. <laughs> so it was hilarious. It was, he was great. It was, the annual meetings were always amazing. People would walk away and just smile and just had a wonderful yeah. time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I remember how yeah. him pulling money from all the agencies <laughs> to support that. <laughs> Can I just respond to that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So as somebody who worked in state government at that time, uh, Ken would always be you know, on the phone, especially around the conference time, uh, looking for folks to contribute to this. And um, you, you absolutely couldn't say no right. to Ken. But one of the things that was incredible about him, and I I have a new appreciation for it, having read the book, Um, incredibly frugal. I mean, those conferences were basic. I lived That that rubber chicken was rubber. (laughs) Um, But he he prided himself on that. And the people who were there, and and it was both public officials who had to pay the, you know, were paying the bills, but it's also a respect for the use of resources. You know, the whole mental health arena is generally 
str generally struggles for proper yes. resourcing. And uh, so you don't want to be holding some kind of a big exactly. fancy thing that's costing you know tens of thousands of dollars. <laughs> so he, uh, he turned it into this very, um, very funny uh, sort of uh, underpinning for the whole the whole day, and um, people could feel ab good about coming and participating and supporting it because it was done uh, with respect for resources. Um, also, in terms of the the, the uh, conferences themselves, you wouldn't dare if you were an official, you wouldn't dare not go. Mm -hmm. right. Because <laughs> there were, it just you, you you both enjoyed it. It was it was fun and it was uplifting and it was reinforcing, but you also wouldn't dare uh, not be there That's because um, he would. Um, oh yeah, he was taking uh, notes. Oh, yeah. yeah, he was taking notes, and it was the place to be about these issues. Oh, it was. That's right. And if yeah. you recall, uh, there was always the worm fund at the annual meetings, and it was the worm fund for Camp Daybreak. That's right. Early on, uh, when I met Ken, uh, we had very similar playful personalities, and he would he would give me the can, and I would be the one walking around the room shaking the can for worms oh for fishing goodness. at camp. Uh, it, was always, it was I always thought it was a very funny bit to do in that room. Yeah, you know, with so many important people from so many different. Uh, agencies and, and walks of life. I just thought it was a very, very funny way to connect people to a, to a wonderful And program. then he would do award ceremony. Yeah. Some, <laughs> and award and so I would see him picking up stuff and like, this, to me, this is for the awards and for this person. I was like, oh, oh my God. But it was great because yeah. people loved it. You have to have a sense of humor to be at the annual meeting. Yeah. yeah. And the food was always great. He, <laughs> he would, Mr. Bishera, he would badger him for the best meals at the lowest price. And Mr. Bashir would always thought the world of Ken. But frugal wasn't the I never thought the word frugal was. I thought, yeah. <laughs> He'll hear this. He'll hear this. Because I. <laughs> and, yeah, just go ahead. Go ahead. Lynn, yeah, it's your turn. Well, my turn. Um, I first met um, Ken after my boss. I worked for the Office of Alcohol and Drug Abuse Programs at the time. It's something totally different now. Um, but. Tom Paris was my boss, and he said, Lee, I want you to go to a meeting. Um, Tom, um, he, he talked about Ken having worked with busloads of people from mental health and taking them over to the state legislature oh, yeah. and advocating for, um, <clears throat> what, uh, for what they needed as mental health clients. But boots on the ground, regular mental health people got to go to the state legislature. And he said, we want to do this with um, people in recovery from substance use. And um, it was interesting because for years I worked at ADAP and it was not fashionable to suggest that you had had a prior problem with substances and you were in recovery. People didn't want to hear about it mm -hmm. until Tom Paris came along. Mm -hmm. And um, we, um, so he got a number of people from our office, Mike O'Hara and Mark Ames, and me, and um, we met at Bethany Church, and Ken Libertoff came in. Hmm. And um, so he was there to drum up support for um, his group that he was going to put together, um, and we called ourselves Friends of Recovery Vermont. And um, he trained us to advocate for what people in recovery from substance use needed. And at that time, um, uh, I think Mark Heller just had started to go testify about his Turning Point Club in White River Junction. And um, we wanted to create a whole array of Turning Point clubs around the state. And like the parody bill, it took a lot of years to get there, but I, I think we started off looking for a dozen, but one at a time. Um, and some, some years, two at a time, we started getting these recovery clubs instituted. and. Um, he wrote a little pamphlet called The Citizen's Guide for Advocacy that he shared with us, and he'd bring us all together um, and do little mini trainings. Um, mm -hmm. And I recall that um, wh what he did is he really gave people in recovery a voice. And it wasn't, you know, every, it wasn't all the spit and polished people in recovery. Um, we had some individuals that were very rough around the edges, and I think fondly of... Um, one woman who was a recovering heroin addict from St. St. Johnsbury, who ultimately, when Governor Douglas um, was in, in office, um, 
had an incredible relationship with him. Mm. And uh, her daughter would go running up to the governor and like tackle him around the knees and hug him. Mm. And I just thought that Ken had this ability to bring uh, people from really diverse backgrounds together mm. and um, give, them, give them a voice with one another. Um, you know, yeah. I certainly recognize everybody, well, all of the officials at this table as people that um, were in the rooms. But what I really appreciated was that ability of Ken's um, in one of those uh, Vermont Association of Mental Health annual meetings to pick out a politician and come up with some anecdote that was hilariously funny. And um, I think someone here said, Ken could say to people what no, no one else could ever say to them. And he would get away with it and people would be laughing. And, you know, he was, he was really, he was kind. He was never mean about anything. I think what I most appreciate was his ability to um, give me a voice and some stature and Simone pride in my own personal recovery. He also, um, we had a number of people um, that then directed Friends of Recovery Vermont um, for years and worked with Ken. And a lot of things happened in terms of getting the recovery centers established. And they continue to happen now. And if it weren't for Ken, I don't think any mm -hmm. of this would have happened mm -hmm. um, or not as easily as, as it has. Thanks, Lee. The story I want to tell is actually in the book, and it, it's pure Ken. Um, so once that parity bill passed in Vermont, of course, that put Ken on the national and international circuit mm. to talk about the bill. And, and, and he, uh, he talks in the book about uh, going to Washington to talk about Vermont's parity bill as it related to a watered down version, what he thought at the federal level. But anyhow, so one, the, the ultimate consulting gig that he got was to go to South Africa. Mm. And, um, and so um, he flies, you know, like long flight to get there. And the woman that picked him up was the uh, advocate that he met in Washington that wanted him to come out and talk to the South African uh, political leadership. And she says, you know, please be down in the lobby at eight. The conference is right in your hotel and, and I'll introduce you and away you go. So he says, great. He was exhausted, beat, but he, you know, he had his new tie and shirt and jacket and, you know, <laughs> dressing up was not his forte. So he, he um, goes, it's about 7.55 and he hits the elevator button to go downstairs and he hops in and all of a sudden he sees the elevator stuck. And he says, holy crap. So he said, oh, well, it'll work out in another minute or two. Well, it's now 8.10 and he's still in the elevator and the conference has already started. So all of a sudden he hears a couple of voices <clears throat> and then they're saying things like, he's down there, he's down there. And so apparently they, the, they had to open a shaft up on the top of the elevator. Oh, yeah. He had to crawl out <laughs> and then they had to pry the doors open and out he went. <laughs> so he gets down, it's around quarter after eight now and she's talking away, waiting for him to come through the door. He comes to the door, soot all over his face. <laughs> his white shirt was black. His tie was ripped. And here's my guest speaker, Ken Liebertov oh, <laughs> from the United States of America. <laughs> and he's thinking, oh, my God. And uh, But he got up in, in all Ken's style. He was able to pull it off. But what a great story. Oh, what his, his liner was... Um, something about the first impression being the lasting one or something. Right, yes. that's right. <laughs> you know, it's just the perfect line to introduce himself to these people. Yeah. What a riot. What a riot. Well, yeah. Wow. So, other stories. I have a, another story. So, Ken um, clearly had a big impact on uh, legislation, on system um, issues, on building an advocacy community. Um, in Vermont, incredibly effective. Um, he also, uh, my involvement with him was largely around children, um, in that that was the world that I worked in. And there was one instance, and I find uh, at, at my age and Ken's age that things are getting a little fuzzy. So I think I have this story correct, but it, it's a good story regardless. Um, 
So uh, at the time, I was the commissioner of DCF, and I got a call from um, Mike Smith, who was the Secretary of Human Services at that moment. Uh, he, was, he was there for about a year. Um, and he said he'd just gotten a call from Ken Liebertoff that there was an outrageous situation in Vermont, and he wanted to know if it's possible that it could be true. And the situation was that a, um, some, a family was having a lot of difficulty. There was an adolescent child who was really <clears throat> struggling and they had ended up calling emergency services. Emergency services ended up calling law enforcement. Um, and eventually the child was taken to the Brattleboro Retreat um, residential unit. But the child could not be transported to um, the Brattleboro Retreat, unless the child was shackled, oh, hands and I remember that hands and oh, feet. Oh, 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 oh with yeah. you know, literally, yeah. um, as they might do with a prisoner who's going yeah, to some high security yeah. situation, and um, the, which then, of course, the child was incredibly upset. The family was incredibly upset that they had called for help at all because this is this is the end result. Mm. So he, he wanted to know from me, is it true that this could be what's happening? Mm. And I told him, yes, it was true because the sheriffs had taken the position that uh, they would not transport anybody, um, adult or child, uh, without all of those provisions because mm. their insurance required it. And if we wanted to drive everybody ourselves as a, the children's system, um, we could do that. But they weren't going to transport. And uh, at which point, um, Ken had called uh, Secretary Smith. Had, had called Mike. Um, and you know, one of Ken's gifts is to know the pressure points to know. And um, you know, Mike was the most powerful man in government. Um, and he he basically was he was so outraged. He got on the phone at that moment with mm -hmm. the sheriff's association and said, you know you're going to change that policy like now or we're going to take all of the state contracts that basically keep the sheriff's departments afloot um, uh -huh. and uh, uh, you, you're going to have nothing. So that needs to change immediately. He then assigned me and Ken <laughs> uh, to figure it out, you know, sort of figure out what are the protocols and how's it going to work and how will we. Um, but that's one of those quiet wow. oh, yeah. stories <clears throat> that, um, where Ken's presence, wow. yeah. because the family had known to call him or the advocacy system that was uh, yeah. trying to figure this out knew to call Ken, um, it prompted um, a system change that has had impact to this day. Um, but it's one of those things wow. that uh, systems don't change by themselves yeah, they require I, that exactly very focused approach. i think he had an amazing ability um to figure out what the systems were mm. i mean he he really understood personal relationships and how they work together and he understood bureaucracy. He was one of the very few people, including most of the people who served in Montpelier, who actually understood how all this stuff went uh, and he knew exactly what pressure points both officially and unofficially, which is some ways more important. So he could reach into bureaucracy and talk to an individual and get them to respond as an individual rather than yes, a bureaucrat. Point. That yes, is something point. that are, there are not many people I know can do that. Good point. Yes. Yeah. How did he get to be this man? <laughs> oh, he was ridiculously yeah. smart. Yeah. He really yeah. was. I think people... I mean, he, obviously he was smart, but I think people underestimated his ability. I, th I think he had a part of his brain that was working on this stuff 100% of the time, even when he was on the tennis courts. Yeah. Um, I really do. Uh, he, yeah. It was like a giant jigsaw puzzle, and he had an incredible gift to put the jigsaw puzzle together. And I, I really do think some of it was just unconscious. He had a... I, you know, almost everything is, in government is divided into two phases. One is the title and the mm -hmm. just job description, and the other is the interpersonal relationships. Mm -hmm. And he had a knack, like very few people I've ever seen, for being able to meld the two of them and figure out where the points were yes. that he could get something yes. done in a hurry if something like that yes. happened. Yes. yes. You know, it's interesting. You're talking about his knack at those critical points in time to... He talks in the book about his mom was very suicidal quite a right. bit. And, and he had just lost his dad and his mother was in tough shape. 
and she was locked in the bathroom. She was um, going to kill herself. <laughs> and so, you know, I could just see his mind going, okay. Man. And he said, at one point, he says to her, his mom, as she's screaming and yelling about wanting to take her life, he says, Mom, who's going to make dinner for me tonight? <laughs> Two seconds later, the door is open. Mom comes out, makes him dinner. It was over. So what do you yep. want? Yeah. What do you want for dinner? <laughs> that was genius. It was genius. <laughs> the tagline, Gary, was, Mom, please make me dinner, and you can kill yourself later. That I somehow suspect wasn't yeah. exactly the way he said it, but <laughs> it was still very impressive. <laughs> yes. yeah, that, that is part of that uh, interpersonal uh, wisdom. Um, and back to the to the tennis foot faulting, you you know when you're serving the ball, you can't step over the baseline because that gives you a tremendous advantage. Right. And Ken at six three or whatever he was um, would step in eighteen inches and, <laughs> and have double the advantage. And we all would call him on it constantly. And finally, in exasperation, I yelled across to him and I said. Ken, stop foot faulting. He said, I will, I will, I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that sort of process orientation, right? And I th he may have gotten that from Harvard, the dictum there in the ed school was, in the psychology department was, don't let your urge for perfection get in the way of doing good. Oh, great, great, that, great line. That was Absolutely. really his, his attitude. Powerful. Great line, yeah. Yeah. terrific. Mm. Any other stories? Dan? I'll just comment on um, that ability to connect with people. Um, you know, whenever Ken would come to camp, it was sort of fleeting, right? He was he'd come on the first day, he'd come on the last day, right? Um, or he'd come in between with a guest or, or someone. Um, but whenever he was there, he would make an effort to, to connect with leadership, certainly, but um, even just random volunteers who were there who were... 15, 16 college age, you know, kids who didn't weren't involved in systems of care. They weren't mental health professionals. They were just people who cared about their neighbors and the community. Right. Um, and uh, to speak to the awards that you talked about before, Ken would always find fun ways to bring people into that conversation and feel like they were a part of something larger than themselves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with a with a some sort of funny knickknack. I'll never forget. Yeah. When I transitioned into the leadership role of director at Camp Daybreak, he literally came with a light up torch um, <laughs> that, he, that he made my predecessor pass to me um, in front of everyone. Oh my which God. was a very funny bit, yeah. but it was also a very kind gesture showing that transfer of leadership. Um, and he actually even uh, he talks in the book about his. Uh, proficiency for being in the circus and desire to want to join the circus. Mm. Uh, one of the funny yeah. things I noticed when he first posted the cover online was that if you look at the book, may I borrow your book? Oh, you please do. Thank you. If you look at the book, in the bottom corner, here, this little blue symbol um, is actually oh, right here. This little blue oh, yeah. symbol is actually uh, from the Two Penny Circus which is a circus that my parents had in the 70s. Mm. Uh, and so no he kidding. was connected uh, to my parents even before I knew him, tw I mean, <clears throat> 20 years before I knew him. Wow. Um, so just a really funny, uh, he was able to connect with all sorts of different people Are in different ways. Are you Donnie's son? I am. Ah! Yeah. Yeah. We were wondering about that. I am Donnie's son, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes indeed. What a wonderful legacy you've got there. Oh, I, I love my parents very much, they're, mm. they're, they're amazing. Um, <laughs> So it was, I saw that picture and I was like, I know that blue bus anywhere. Uh, it was before my time, before I was born, but mm. certainly I've seen pictures of it uh, around. And it was just a very lovely reminder of how Ken connected with different people in very different ways, mm. but they always felt like they were brought in mm. to his inner circle, um, mm. which was I, oh, love, which is a lovely thing about Ken and I, I will always mm. love. Mm. Yeah. Anyone ever go up to his house? Yeah, sure. It, he lived yeah. in one house. His, yeah, he lives on Spiral Farm Road. Yeah, I don't know if I'm supposed to give that out, but <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, but, uh, yeah, he's lived there for a long time, and I was just up there the other day, and yeah. it's an old farmhouse, and he loved every second of it, and yep, yep. he's you know he's a happy man. That you know, I remember when he had his hernia operation. He told me the story about the doctor 
going to his house, not stuffy, going to his house and it was the middle of the night and he was up in his bedroom and then the shade was down. But he said if anybody had gone past the house with cause stuffy was in the outline of the shade would have thought something weird was going on. <laughs> that was the funny thing. Then I would have to, then I, he, you know, I brought up food for him and office stuff because yeah. he was laid, laid up for a while. Yeah. But, you know, that's, that's what changed, doing that for him and just seeing what a magnificent person he really is. Cool. I mean, so kind. I mean, mm -hmm. I feel really blessed that he's come into my life, that our paths have crossed because he's, what he's done has made me a much better person with the knowledge of mental health and things like that that I not never involved in, you know. So yeah. I really learned out in all the politics and being at the legislature, but previously with VNRC, I was at the legislature too, checking and chasing after all the staff there. But it was always interesting to go there and the people that he would talk to and they would listen to him. They would like, they knew what he was talking about and they would never give him any crap. I mean, the static or whatever. I think you're allowed to say that on CCTV. I think you're okay. yeah. I've heard much yeah. worse yeah, on CCTV. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. After he retired, he once invited uh, me up for lunch and uh, the summer after camp had ended. Mm. And it was August and every August there is this magical week in between when uh, my wife's summer ends and she goes back to school for, um, <coughs> for all her trainings and stuff for the school year but my daughter emma is still home with me so we call it daddy daughter week and so i said to Taylor, i said you know i it's daddy daughter week are you okay with emma coming to the house as well for lunch and he was like of course and she couldn't have been more than four at the time she's 12 now um and he was so wonderful with her mm. he didn't she didn't know him from adam uh you know and he, he's 20 feet tall and she was three feet tall at the time um but he showed her around the house and gave her a huge tour mm. and they have uh, apple trees in the backyard mm. and he showed emma the trees and how to pick the apples and it was just a very very sweet yeah. Yeah. moment yeah mm -hmm. and emma i mean emma sort of knows him now but not not nearly as much as then but um was just always felt connected to him in that yeah, way that's another that. that story that about yeah. the apple trees reminds me of something else that got by a lot of people he would seem like he was wasting time and he yeah. it was working every second of oh, yeah. that. There was, a, I mean, not that he was manipulating Emma, but, sure, of course. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you'd think he was not getting around to it. He was about 18 steps ahead of everybody else when he was when he was plotting and planning for how things were going to go. And yeah. it was it was great. Before you knew it, you'd agreed to something you had no intention of agreeing true, exactly. to. Exactly. True. Exactly. Yes. <clears throat> Well, he was he was absolutely wonderful at working with um, our group of um, people in recovery, making us into a really cohesive unit. And, um, you know, and we were planning like recovery day at the state house in room 11. And he was always slipping us ideas like cake. You need a cake. And um, he, he had us cutting up cake and then delivering it in person to legislators and sitting down at tables and talking to legislators. And uh, it really helped me develop um, uh, my relationship with Tom Koch, who was my state legislator and who worked on the elephant in the living room, which was about the substance abuse um, status of individuals in Vermont at the time. And, um, you know, it was just amazing that you know, this ragtag group of people that came, well, initially from probably central Vermont, but we'd, we'd try and haul in a few people from the far reaches of the state on, on the Board of Friends of Recovery. Um, we had Diane Harrington, who worked for Jim Jeffords' office, and Mike O'Hara from um, um, the Office of Alcohol and Drug Abuse Programs, who was a big time AA guy. Uh, and uh, Mark Ames, who was also in um, recovery. Uh, you know, it was just everybody that was in recovery that suddenly had a voice and could work together to figure out how to put our best foot forward to, and to identify and ask for what we needed. And um, Ken worked quietly behind the scenes, but he always made us feel comfortable and supported us and um, and really work to train us to be able to speak for ourselves. 
That was another interesting thing about how he worked. Tom Koch was a conservative, what passed in those days for a conservative Republican. He wasn't a <laughs> lunatic like was this. today. That means something different. Yes. But he was conservative about money and careful. So when he got up and advocated for the Vermont Association for Mental Health or for mental health or substance abuse, people listened because they're going, what? This is a guy who doesn't like to spend mm -hmm. money. Right. Mm. And Ken knew that. And he was so smart about putting together coalitions when he was working in the legislature. And he, he would never do it the old fashioned way meet with people, you know, hope you, he would always do it through the people who would move mm. people like Tom Koch. Mm. Oh, and Jim Letty from, right. you got, you got yes. Tom from Central Vermont and Jim Letty from up in Burlington. And they just did powerful things. Yep. Yeah. In well, terms Jim of, was, you know, the head of mental, Howard Mental Health for years. So he was, he was sort of, you know, already in the stable, but yeah, there were some people there who ended up on the, on the team who looking from the outside, you would never have expected that. And that yeah. was his gift. Yes. And he was yeah. patient and he knew how to push the buttons. And there's no better button than having somebody who is a human being who is suffering because of substance abuse or mental health mm -hmm. connect with another with the legislature. That was very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. Most lobbyists can't do that <clears throat> because they're usually advocating for things we don't approve of. Right. Um, but he was advocating that for something that, you know, there are a lot of people um, who have mental health issues in their family or substance abuse. He knew who they were and he knew how to touch them. Yeah. 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 It was great. He really, he worked, he worked well with us. Yeah. And so, Governor, how did the re relationship between you and Ken change, if at all, when you became governor? I became more businesslike because my schedule was insane and his right. was always insane. He always seemed to be very relaxed, and, but he, you know, he had 50,000 things he had to do on his list and they all had to get done by the night. And how he got through all that, you right. guys yeah. can tell me because right. he really did every day. He could have worked 100 hours a day, yeah. uh, but he somehow managed to get it all done mm. with, with looking effortless the whole mm. time. Um, so I didn't see a lot of them because the, when I was governor, because I was pretty careful about health care and wanted to right. do the right thing, right. most of the things we were able to do, we got done, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he, most of the things on his list. Mm -hmm. The bigger problems that we had were the bureaucratic problems, what wasn't working in the mm -hmm. government, um, you know, in, in issues like substance abuse. And we talked about that right, right. a little bit. Yeah. But I didn't see a lot of them after that. Yeah. I was, as I said, I was on the board of uh, VAMH for a while. And then as I got more and more crazy <clears throat> dizzy, I had to get off. Yep, yep. Yeah. Did you team up? Uh, I know there was one thing that he was focused on for a while and got accomplished, which was um, doctors receiving gifts from, pharma yeah. from remember that. pharmaceutical oh companies. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. Yes. I do. Yeah, he, he, pharma, big pharma. Big pharma. Big pharma. Yeah. Marge from, he was talked about this woman, Marge from Big Pharma would come and he would have conversations. They sit at the same table and he, would, he wouldn't put up with it. Yeah. He was. Yeah. As, I don't remember that. Isn't oh, it's that, huge. Oh, yeah, it was a huge was, issue. For I don't know a year. what year that was. I, I can't. It was, I was, it was working for the, a, the oh. mid to late nineties. I, I, I think because. Oh, yeah, I, I was oh no, 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 no! <clears throat> I, I didn't work there until two thousand ten to twenty fourteen, and that's when Big Pharma had come in and with all the drugs, and he yeah. was all against all the stuff came out. All these doctors, the, the right. farmers <laughs> were give the people pharmaceuticals were given all these free. Stuff to doctors, oxycotton and all the other yeah. stuff. Yeah, that the was doctors long was just, after I'd left. Yeah, yeah. And the yeah. doctors were just passed. I was out. gone in 2000, 2003. Yeah. Was my last. Mm. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. That was back when I yeah. we were working I, there. There was a there was a time I, I'm forgetting the year. Apparently, maybe it was in the early 2000s where um, we would get an annual donation for Camp Daybreak from Pfizer mm. uh, that they were funding <laughs> Camp Daybreak for the truth the time. I think. Um, yeah. And and <clears throat> Ken finally yeah. was just like, no, like we can't do this anymore. Mm. I remember that. Um, I remember that too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And to his credit, I mean, that was the right thing. It, it the was the right thing, thing to do, but the right. right thing to do for right. sure. Well, that's a classic lobbying technique. You make somebody dependent on your money, and then right. you have to sh shut up a little that's bit. Right. right. In fact, the National Mental Health Association was taking a lot of money from pharma, yeah. um, and he and the Vermont chapter, which Ken was, wouldn't accept any. Yeah. And he was after the national organization for. I mean the. 
hundreds and hundreds of thousands yeah. of dollars. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Small bits and pieces coming back as you bring stories yeah, up right. like yeah. that. Yeah. That was interesting because I always the other thing I Ethical. always thought was that he was so far the national most of those national organizations are big bureaucracies. Right. And I don't think the National Association of Mental Health was an exception to that. And That's Ken right. would not put up with that. No. He, he would right. because I, there was always a reason you couldn't do something. That's right. You know, and That's he right. was not going to have any of that. Yes. Yeah. In fact, that, like you said, that uh, big money kept the National Mental Health Association quiet at the most opportune time to say something to help parity or mm -hmm. to move something forward. All right. of a sudden, they were silent, and he would speak up from right. Vermont because they were they were steeped in money. They couldn't they yeah. couldn't say anything. That was yeah. yeah. I, just, I had an observation as I'm listening to um, everybody here. Um, as I think about Ken and his contributions and his role, um, he may be the the most perfect example that I know of of a person's a person finding their calling and living mm, yeah. and living it out. Mm, true, for sure. I mean, he, uh, um, he he was masterful in what he did, but it was it was uniquely him. That's true. Um, yeah. So his skill set, his experiences, and when you read the book, it's like. I know this guy, and and it all makes sense. It all makes perfect sense. But yes. um, so many of us in our careers are trying to find the right fit between our mm. personality and our skill set and our duties. Yeah. His was like absolutely aligned Bingo. in that role. Yes. Yeah, exactly absolutely. right. Well, did you know that he was executive director of the Washington County Youth Service Bureau way back? Yeah. And he was hired mm -hmm. when the first guy left, and then uh, Tom Howard. Yes. Took it over, mm -hmm. but Ken was there for like three three years, and I worked and I've done some part time work. I worked for them for a while. Now they're the, called Elevate Youth Services. Uh -huh. uh, they're up in the, the old Wedgwood place. Yes, but yeah, he was yeah. yeah. Wow. But I always used to wonder how does this guy get to what a great job. I mean, he, he's sort of above the fray. He's not accountable for <laughs> delivery of, you know, he, he was accountable for the specific things right. in his organization. But um, and yet he's like unbelievably effective in that role with his personality, with his um, and it was a it was a winning yeah. uh, comedy. It's always great to watch him. Uh, I mean, I, I, I was, I keep saying, blessed working with him and seeing how he managed everything and how he made it work. Mm -hmm. He really made it work. The hard work, I mean, hours. I mean, I know he would spend hours yeah. in his office, you know, at, at night after I left that he would be doing, making phone calls and, you know, things like that. Makes mm -hmm. some, you know, it was an incredible hard worker. Very inspirational. He inspires me yeah, to be a better person. Yeah. yeah, Gary, I told you a little bit about this. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Ellen and I went over to see him Sunday night, just passed, and we brought uh, uh, Ken and Sarah a hot dish, which <laughs> she was wildly enthusiastic mm -hmm. about. And we sat with him for about a half an hour. He was in bed. He was tired, uh, quite lucid. And I said, Ken, I'm going to be doing this thing with uh, Gary DeCarlos, and uh, what would you want me to say? And he said, I don't know, you talk about tennis, you can talk about breakfasts at the wayside, uh, you talk about our friends. And, and I said, well, you know, I, I remember that I might have been the first person to read your first short st story, your, your anecdote mm. came out of your writer's class with Maggie Thompson. And I think it was Bojano's Bar and Grill. And he said, <laughs> That's I, right. I think you're right. That <laughs> may, and I said, I was blown away. I said, Ken, you've got to keep on this and keep mm. working on it. And, I said, you know, but the one story that doesn't appear, well, many stories don't appear, but uh, you should write it up. It's the story of how you learned about Montpelier. I said, you, t you told me this anecdote. You, um, you, you, Khan was playing UVM, and the team traveled up uh, to Burlington, and you guys won. And you said you went to a fraternity house. And you didn't know anything about fraternity houses, you said. Um, but 
there was beer and there were a lot of girls. And, uh, and you wound up with uh, a basketball playing girl sitting on your lap. And she, he said, well, where are you from? And he, she, she said, from Montpelier. And he said, I said to her, Montpelier, where's that? Canada? <laughs> and, and then I said, well, um, I guess I'll share that story. And he said, just make sure that you say that that girl was the captain of the UVM girls basketball team. <laughs> I hate to say this, but I think she's also my dentist now. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's amazing. Classic for that. That's hilarious. That's so funny. Oh, that's great. We're not going to say any names yeah, here. Right? <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah. Oh, oh, my. That's great. That's amazing. That's Right. Any other stories? Any any last thoughts you want to share? I'll just um, go on. It's yeah. a sort of double down on, yeah. on how gracious Ken is. Mm. Um, you know, one one of the things that I always loved about him was that, you know, whether he was sending you just some sort of random file through the mail or whatever, he always wrote a nice note. You know, that always it's made true. you feel special and important. Mm. And true. he, I came to realize later that I was not the only person who received these notes, um, that many people who were in part of our Camp Daybreak bubble would often get very nice notes from Ken. And it just so happens the other day I was reading the book and was looking for a bookmark. And I, when I reached into a drawer and I found this note mm. that Ken wrote to my wife oh. in 2008. Wow. Okay. Um, we had just finished camp and it's on the old VAMH. Oh my gosh, yeah. You know, letterhead uh, there. And uh, we had just finished camp. We were, I'm going to say, 10 days from getting married. Uh, um, it was my first full year as director of Camp Daybreak. Uh, but he wrote this lovely, this lovely note to her. It's uh, on a postcard. Uh, and she was like, oh my gosh, that's, that's, I remember getting that. What right? did she say? Did he you, said, uh, hi, Audrey, my wife. Uh, thanks for your great leadership at Camp Daybreak. With appreciation, Ken Lee. That's um, beautiful. Yeah. And just it uh, just speaks to how sweet and how giving he is um, in, in any moment, uh, big or small. Yes. That's a yeah. big or small. That's yeah. absolutely right. Very and good. One other quick story, because yeah. I know he will, he always tells that to me anytime we were friends. When I first started for him, I had worked in other offices with Microsoft, Outlook, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I got to his office. Then he had AOL email. Still, and I was like, still, you have to get rid does, of this. It still does. Yeah, he's still not does. for the office. Yeah. This is AOL. And he still has his AOL email after all this. Yes. But he was so, he couldn't believe. I was like, what's wrong with AOL? And I was just like, it's AOL. You know, this is a business office. We need, you know, Microsoft Office and all this other stuff. Yeah. And we finally got it. But boy, it was, he was like, yeah. he was... <laughs> <laughs> I was like, he felt offended. <laughs> he literally felt offended that mm. I said, you can't get rid of it. AOL's crap. Mm. You know, you can't get rid of it. It's not for a business. Mm. But he still has it. Kenny Allen? Yes, he oh. does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll never forget that. His face, he, it was, and this is a story. He, he always shares a story with anybody who knew that. Jimmy, when Jimmy came here, he told me I had to get rid of AOL. Yeah. So <laughs> that was a great, yeah. yeah. So that, that, that was a funny thing. He always shares that. Yeah. Uh, it's so funny. <laughs> well, have we done him justice? I don't know. Uh, I think yeah. so. we, could, we could be here for hours yeah. Yeah. to do him justice. So, so that probably I'm always in awe of him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's my hero. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So, to Ken, we all love you dearly. Yeah. I yes. hope yes. we uh, shared some appropriate stories for the audience to get a sense of this wonderful man called Ken Liebertoff. And uh, we'll see you around the corner. Mm. Thank you. <laughs>